And this is VOA1, The Hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today on the program, you will hear from Brian Lynn, Dan Friedel, and John Russell. Later, Katie Weaver and Ashley will bring us the next part in our series on America's National Parks. But first, here is Brian Lynn. The head of the Virgin Hyperloop Transport System says the company aims to begin carrying passengers by 2027. Josh Giegel helped start the company and is its chief executive officer. He made the comments to a Reuters reporter at the company's development and testing center near Las Vegas, Nevada. The Virgin Hyperloop system is based on a technology called magnetic levitation. It uses magnetic fields to lift a vehicle off the ground a little and to push it forward. Some high-speed trains also use this technology. But unlike trains, a hyperloop is designed to operate within tubes containing very little air. Electric propulsion moves vehicles called pods through the tubes at high speeds. The system offers nearly silent travel and reportedly releases no carbon emissions. Last November, Giegel rode inside a Virgin Hyperloop pod along with another company official during the system's first test with passengers. The company said the vehicle reached a top speed of 172 kilometers per hour in that test. But Virgin Hyperloop says the system's pods are designed to move at much higher speeds, up to 1,200 kilometers per hour. It says such a vehicle could complete a trip between New York and Washington, D.C. in 30 minutes. That would be two times as fast as a jet flight and four times faster than a high-speed train. It will feel like an aircraft at takeoff and once you're at speed, Giegel told Reuters. You won't even have turbulence because our system is completely able to react to all of that turbulence. The pods will seat 28 passengers and could be specially designed to travel long or short distances or to carry goods, the company said. While the system is still in early development, Giegel predicted that commercial operations could start as early as 2027. Virgin Hyperloop is looking to first develop passenger systems in India, where the transport system is overcrowded, and in Saudi Arabia, which lacks infrastructure. Giegel said it could be the first form of transportation in 100 years to revolutionize travel, as cars, trains, and airplanes did before. It starts off with two people riding a hyperloop. It ends with hundreds of millions of people riding on a hyperloop, and that's what the 2020s, the Roaring Twenties, will be, he added. 
Virgin Hyperloop has partners that include Virgin Group founder Richard Branson and the port operations company DP World, which is owned by the Dubai government. I'm Brian Lynn. President Joe Biden has released a plan that aims to conserve nearly one-third of America's land and water by 2030. The plan, announced last week, calls for supporting local conservation projects across the country in an effort to safeguard public, private, and tribal areas. The plan is described in a report called America the Beautiful. It says the proposal aims to make conservation and restoration of land and water a top goal of the Biden administration. The plan would clean drinking water, increase green space, and improve access to outdoor enjoyment, the report says. It also aims to restore healthy fisheries and reduce the risk of wildfires. The report says the efforts will produce thousands of new jobs while seeking new solutions to climate change and environmental justice. The plan calls for increased efforts to improve access to the outdoors by disadvantaged communities. President Biden has set a goal of conserving at least 30 percent of U.S. land and water by 2030. The report says that if successful, the plan will help slow climate change and protect some of the country's most beautiful land for future generations. The Center for American Progress is a private research organization that presents progressive ideas. It says that currently, about 12% of the country's land and 25% of its water are protected. The protected areas are not just parks. They include wilderness areas, refuges, agricultural land, forests, and other areas covered under conservation agreements. The plan suggests a series of actions. They include an expanded federal aid program to create local parks, support tribal conservation aims, expand wildlife areas, and increase access to outdoor exercise. The proposal also calls for creating a program to organize civilians to work on conservation and restoration projects across the nation. The plan follows through on one of Biden's main campaign promises. It also builds on the Great American Outdoors Act. The act was a 2020 law that approved nearly $3 billion for conservation and outdoor projects. Biden's plan depends heavily on voluntary conservation efforts by farmers, forest owners, and fishing communities. The administration did not provide a cost estimate for the proposal. However, officials said much of the spending could be covered by department budgets, the 2020 Outdoors Law, the 2018 Farm Bill, and Biden's recently proposed $2.3 trillion infrastructure plan. The report says the plan should be seen as a call to action to support locally-led conservation and restoration efforts of all kinds and all over America. I'm Dan Friedel. Nobel Prize.
Prize winner Bob Dylan is considered to be one of the best American songwriters. In today's Everyday Grammar, we will explore how Blowin' in the Wind, a famous Bob Dylan song, can teach you about English grammar. You will learn about question words, nouns, and more. Let's begin by listening to part of the song. Dylan's song has a group of questions, one after the other, followed by an answer. Let's explore the grammar of the words in greater detail. In English, we use question words, what, where, how, to ask for information. The word how generally asks about manner, the way in which something is done. For example, imagine you saw a circus performer swallow fire. You might ask them, How did you do that? But when used with words such as much and many, how asks about quantities. For example, you might hear an American ask the following about a price. How much money does it cost? Or, how much does it cost? Here is another example of a quantity question. How many people came to the Bob Dylan concert? But, how do we know when to use much and when to use many? The answer is about nouns. We describe nouns as either common or proper. Common nouns include words such as music, song, or guitar. The words themselves do not point to an exact, specific thing. Proper nouns include words with an exact, single meaning. Bob Dylan, the United States of America, blowin' in the wind, and so on. There are two kinds of common nouns— Count and non-count nouns. Count nouns include words like guitar or song. You can count guitars and songs. Consider the following statements. I own five guitars. I wrote three songs. The question form, how many, is used with plural count nouns. For example... How many guitars do you own? I own five guitars. Non-count nouns include words like money or music. I need to make money. I love music. In general, the question form how much is used with non-count nouns. How much money did you spend on that new guitar? I spent all of the money that I earned last week. How does this discussion connect with the Bob Dylan song? If you listen carefully to the Bob Dylan song, you will notice that the structure, how many, plays an important part. Questions about count nouns make the base of Dylan's song. He does not sing about non-count nouns. He does not ask, how much? And the answer to his questions is always the same. The next time you listen to any song in English, try to look for some kind of pattern. One way to think about Dylan's song is that it is about questions, answers, and count nouns. But other songs have different structures, ideas, and grammar points. By carefully studying songs, you can learn a lot about English grammar. I'm John Russell. Our National Parks journey takes us to an extreme landscape in Colorado. Around us are clear lakes, 
aspen and fir trees, and mountain peaks that rise over 4,400 meters. Welcome to Rocky Mountain National Park. The vast Rocky Mountains range extends from the western United States up to Canada. National parks in both countries protect many of the huge peaks. Here in Colorado, Rocky Mountain National Park covers about 1,100 square kilometers. Although it is much smaller than other western parks, like Yellowstone, it welcomes almost as many visitors each year. People from around the world come to experience its alpine or high mountain environment. In the spring and summer, wildflowers burst to life and many kinds of butterflies arrive. In the fall, the aspen trees turn bright yellow and orange. In the winter, deep snow blankets the park. Its peaceful alpine lakes freeze over. One of the major sights here is the Continental Divide. The area in the high mountains separates the rivers that flow into the Pacific Ocean from the rivers that flow into the Atlantic Ocean. The Rockies' huge glaciers form the rivers. Glaciers help tell the natural history of the land. Over millions of years, glaciers carved deep canyons out of rock. Erosion from wind and water formed the mountain's sharp summits that we see today. Rock at the top of these summits is some of the oldest found on Earth. It was not until 11,000 years ago that humans began living in the area. The Utes tribe settled here for part of the year thousands of years ago. Winter was too severe to survive. When the weather warmed, they lived in the green valleys and meadows and near the lakes. In 1803, the U.S. government gained control of the land we now call Rocky Mountain National Park. It came as part of the Louisiana Purchase, which almost doubled the size of the United States. In the 1840s, American writer Rufus Sage came to the Rockies. He wandered the area from 1841 until 1843, spending time with fur trappers, Native Americans, soldiers, and hunters. His long and detailed account of mountain life was published in 1846. He called it Scenes in the Rocky Mountains. Rufus Sage wrote, Further on were yet higher summits, surmounted by pines and cedars, raising their heads in stately grandeur far above the sweet valleys at their feet. Taken together, the scenery was not only romantic and picturesque, but bewitching in its beauty and repulsive in its deformity. Beginning in the late 1850s, gold and silver rushes brought huge crowds to the Colorado Rockies. Miners arrived in search of the precious metals. They settled temporary cities. One of the best known 
is called Lulu City. It was settled in the late 1870s after miners discovered silver nearby. By 1880, more than 500 miners lived in Lulu City. It had a meat shop, a post office, and many houses and mining companies. Lulu City was short lived. In just five years, miners left town, seeking other opportunities. Today, some visitors choose to hike to this ghost town, where they will find old cabins and remains of buildings. As more and more people came to the area, concern for protecting the natural environment grew. In 1909, the nature guide and naturalist Enos Mills began pushing for the creation of a national park here. He first climbed the towering Long's Peak when he was just 15 years old. Long's Peak is the area's tallest mountain at 4,346 meters. Mills made the hike 40 times by himself during his lifetime and almost 300 times as a mountain guide. Mills wrote and gave talks about the Long's Peak area to urge Congress to make it a national park. On January 26, 1915, Mills got his wish. President Woodrow Wilson signed the Rocky Mountain National Park Act to make America's 10th national park. The Denver Post newspaper called Mills the father of Rocky Mountain National Park. Today, more than 3 million people visit Rocky Mountain National Park each year. Many visitors arrive by car. They drive the Trail Ridge Road, which winds through meadows and forests and up the mountains. The road was built in the 1930s during the Great Depression. At the time, many of the western national parks were served by the railway. Travelers arrived on trains. But a railroad never served Rocky Mountain National Park. The National Park Service described it as always an auto park. The high number of visitors and vehicles caused concern. In the 1970s, park officials began managing crowds. They started using buses in the park and created a campsite system in the wild backcountry. Today, conservation efforts continue. Park officials educate visitors and urge them to respect the natural environment. Rocky Mountain National Park's scenery and wildlife attract huge numbers of visitors. The park has over 480 kilometers of hiking trails. They include challenging climbs up some of the tallest mountains and forest hikes that lead to the park's many waterfalls. They also include trails to crystal blue alpine lakes. One leads to Mills Lake in honor of Enos Mills. The view of Long's Peak from the lakeside is one of the finest views in the whole park. 
One of the most extreme hikes in the park is the Continental Divide Loop. The 86-kilometer path cuts through glacial valleys and past lakes and waterfalls. It takes most hikers at least six days to complete. Long hikes give visitors a chance to experience Rocky Mountain wildlife. Within the park are hundreds of elk and bighorn sheep, as well as a small moose population. The park's huge number of large animals makes it one of the best places in America for wildlife watching. Butterflies fill the park's meadows. Some of the most common kinds are the painted lady, the arctic blue, and the western pine elfin. Butterflies help researchers in the park study the effects of climate change. Scientists and volunteers collected information on butterfly populations from 1995 until 2011. They identified more than 140 butterfly species. Park visitors also come to fish, bike, and go horseback riding. The animals are permitted on most of the park's hiking trails. You can ride in the park on horseback. You can explore on foot. You can sleep under the stars. You can sit by a clear, quiet lake. However you visit Rocky Mountain National Park, you will likely find, in the words of Eno Smills, the paths of peace and a repose that is sweeter than sleep. I'm Katie Weaver. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson.